Yep. Well, welcome to the first of two sessions with the Student Publication Association. Uh, I'm Morris Alexander. I'm the Scottish Regional Officer for the SBA. And uh, today we've got Connor Matchett with us, who is a, a graduate in philosophy from the University of Edinburgh and a reporter for the Edinburgh Evening News. And he's been so nice to prepare us a presentation, which uh, he'll gladly take questions for at the end. And uh, it's gonna be really interesting. So uh, jump into that. All right, hello friends. Um, good to see you. I recognize some of the names of folk who are here. Um, what I'm gonna do, uh, just to give you some background on who I am, I'm. Uh, a political reporter at the Scotsman um, nowadays um, and uh, previously at the Evening News so Morris isn't too wrong <laughs> um, and um, this presentation is relatively simple I want to give uh, people uh, basically a how to blag your way to a story is the idea so I'm going to screen share um, it's going to be vaguely interactive so if you could ch in chat respond to questions that I ask you guys, that would be massively helpful just to keep it going along. Um, and as Morris said, um, ask your questions at the end, to be honest, if you want to, if you have a urgent question in the middle of it, um, there's few enough people here to for that to be absolutely fine. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen quickly and we'll go from there. Um, okay, okay. So I'm hoping all of you can see it. Um, and see the presentation. So to start with, Journalism 101. This is the idiot's guide to how to get yourself a news story. Um, so you might ask yourself, what is a story? Um, what do you think uh, that might be? Well, first and foremost, you need to know what your readers want to read. Um, this is something that I find is across the board, a uh, misapprehension among uh, student journalists often, and even, you know, professional journalists. Um, with every story, you need to ask yourself, you know, what do your readers actually want to read about? What do they want to know about? Whether it's relevant to them? Does it impact them personally? Um, will they read it? And the kicker for student journalism is, journalism is uh, will they actually care? Because fundamentally, if you're writing stories that people don't care about, um, you're not going to um, impact anything. You're not going to be writing the stories that matter. Um, so this is the interactive bit. Um, <laughs> I'm going to show you three stories that I personally wrote pre-COVID. And I'm going to ask you to guess which one got the most page views, which is what we use in the industry to kind of judge success to an extent um, with subscriptions it's a bit different nowadays but um, this is a good basic metric for for success so I wrote this one which was quite a long investigation that I did back in February last year which feels like a lifetime ago and um, they're all Edinburgh based so apologies for those who don't live here um, I got this one which was a funny one off the back of a complaint from uh, a reader of, of, of the evening news and we have this one which if you remember the days before COVID when weather actually made a difference in people li people's lives, um, it's this story. So uh, Underbelly is story one, Lothian Buses is story two, Edinburgh Waverley, Storm Kira, story three. Um, if I could have you rank from most read to least read in the chat, that would be great. I'll give you um, about 30 seconds to do that. Um, so if you think it's left to right, least most read to least read, go one, two, three. If you think it's the other way around, go three, two, one, or any other combination of that. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Anthony. That's a great start. Thank you, Morris. Thank you. Don't think anyone was in this. I gave this presentation to a group of Edinburgh University students a while ago, so I hope none of you were in that, but I think that's everyone who is watching has seen has answered so underbelly 28,000 local news story that's very reasonable that was a good story for for me and for the paper we we splashed on it it was it was good affected a lot of people 
it wasn't read as much as Lothian buses. Um, everyone loves a story about a local bus company getting things wrong. Um, and that was quite a good one. Again, respectable amount. And this was one of, if not my best read story of the year, which was Storm Kira. Now, I think Che got it right. Um, who's listening in the background. And I think that is it. Some of you went for almost the exact opposite, I think, um, or close to. Um, but next one. So this is during the first three months of the pandemic. I think these are all stories that I wrote in either April, March, April or May. So gardening business offering brown bin service, there's a word missing from that headline, inundated with calls after council stopped picking up garden waste. Row over height of hedge between Aragon and Edinburgh neighbours to be discarded by the Scottish government. Personally, my favourite story of uh, early lockdown. And Edinburgh McDonald's donate toys and Happy Meals boxes to mum worried about coronavirus impact on her autistic sons. So these were all written April, May, early April. I think if people remember, you'll remember everyone on Facebook and Twitter were crying out for positive news. So bear that in mind when you choose. Same roles, one, two, three, which one would you think from most to least read? And I'll give you 30 seconds to pop in your answers to that as well. So Harry's gone two, three, one, Anthony, three, one, two, Che, three, one, two, Morris, three, two, one, Bree, three, two, one, Luke, Chafer, three, two, one, Ben, one, three, two. So 61,000 people read a story about a gardening business offering brand bids, probably the best free advertising that business has ever had. Um, honest to God, I think that is more than all the stories or most all of the proper hard news stories I wrote during the first few months of COVID that did better. The hedge, 37,000. That was more than my long investigation. Um, but again, still less than the gardening business. And everyone, this is a common issue, everyone on Facebook shouting for positive news, didn't want to read about anything bad or COVID related during lockdown. Well, they didn't click on it, did they? <laughs> so people, the I don't actually think anyone got that one right. It was one, it was one, two, three. Did anyone get that one right? No, no one at all. So it gives you it gives you a basic kind of idea of what I'm talking about here. Essentially, readers don't read what they think they do. They often read completely the opposite of what they think they read. And just because they say they want something doesn't mean they'll read it. This is a common thing. You see this on Twitter all the time if you're a journalist. And I'm sure if you follow journalism, you'll see people going, oh, we don't want to read bad news. Well, they do. They love it. Um, fundamentally, you have to judge your stories on the data you have. So if you've written what you think is a phenomenally interesting story with massive amounts of impact and you know relevance um but it's only getting two or three retweets on twitter and your website analytics are saying that it's been read by 10 people it's just not as good a story as you thought it might be it might be good public service wise we have a phrase in journalism called public service journalism which is you know covering things that are important but not necessarily get read but you should judge your stories with the data you have and work out your view on what equals good engagement or, or a good read. Yeah, a good story on a topic you'll read a show rather than say they care about will always do well. So the best thing I can give as an example for that is, and this is going back to local news in the, in the evening news, is that you our readers love, absolutely adore any story about the weather. It can be the dullest thing in the world. It can be there'll be rain today. And they'll read that more than they'll read anything about the council or anything about, you know, good news stories or food and drink, etc. They also, despite saying on Facebook and Twitter constantly that they don't like the way the evening news has become a property advert website, any property story about a property that has, you know, 12, 20 bedrooms and a flock of sheep outside will get read a million times. Well, it's over, over exaggeration, but they do incredibly well, these stories. Um, so to move on, how to be a reporter. There's, re there's reporters who've been in the job longer than me on this call um, looking at you, Bree. So please do pipe in if you, <laughs> if you disagree with anything. But reporting is generally not the same as being a journalist. Journalists come in many shapes and sizes and colours and types. 
you can be a comment writer, you can be a sub editor, which is someone who changes and, and uh, you know, cleans up copy. You could be a section editor or you can be a designer. They're all journalists, but reporters, we care about facts and we, we tell stories and we write stories or, you know, uh, tell stories over video, et cetera. So if you want to be a reporter and you want to be doing news, what do you have um, in your back pocket ready to go? You have contacts and contacts are people you know. Um, so you have social media, as we all know, social media, thanks to Hands Forth uh, uh, Parish Council this week, we can see how much social media can lead to the uh, elevation of parish council meetings to national news. Um, and you have your patch, which is in simple terms, the area in which you cover. This is something really important, I think, for student journalists to keep in mind. Um, local news is pretty pared back now, nowadays. We don't have much money. Um, in Edinburgh, I think we have a maximum of six or seven reporters. 20 years ago, that would have probably been 15 or 20. 30, 40 years ago, that could have been 40 or 50. So if you're a student journalist and you're, you're covering your student town, often you'll have very little, if not absolutely no competition. Um, and my one biggest suggestion to all of you, if you want to grow your readership, um, is if it's not student related, and your paper is supposedly a student newspaper, bin it. I honestly don't give two hoots what a student in Sterling cares about um, Donald Trump's victory, unless it has some relevance to the people who are reading your newspaper. Um, similarly, if you've got a student who, you know, if you've got a Aberdeen University student who is involved in uh, the Capitol building storming as a far right activist, Great story if you can get in touch with them because they're a student at your university. Basically, there's a there's a phrase in Scottish journalism, which I'm sure many of you have heard before, is put a kilt on it. If it's a national story or a global story that needs a Scottish twist, you put a kilt on it anywhere you can. The classic one that you'll probably see, have seen do the rounds on Twitter is anything related to Donald Trump reported by the Ayrshire News, which is local golf club owner does something ridiculous. Um, it's a good good uh, um, lesson to take forward. So how to source a story. Contacts to start with. They can be literally anyone um, from cleaning staff to, you know, leaders of political parties to, you know, in student senses, you could even have a good relationship with your vice chancellor or with your professor. Um, they can be literally anyone you meet. Um, contact building is a difficult skill. It's not something you learn overnight, but it's something that if you're generally a nice person and don't rub people up the wrong way, you'll be probably good enough at. Um, all you do is you talk to people, you note down their contact details, um, if they're if they're going to give it to you, and you just build that relationship as you would with a friend. Um, the difference is is that you probably both understand that it's a bit of a professional relationship. There's some uh, examples of the sorts of people who can be this. I think often, you know, some of the best student journalism we see is when students really make the most of their network at university. So, for example, um, if you have lots of friends in halls um, and you have a few student union staff members, you could get a really good lockdown story if, for example, you know, like there was, there was people being locked inside um, student halls for periods of time um, or in a student union. If there's a bus stop that means the police are called and you've got a mate who works for the SU, you've got a story there. Um, as I said, it takes time. You're not going to get a scoop within five minutes of meeting someone. You're not going to walk up to someone in the student union, start up a conversation and come out with the best story of the year. All you're doing is you're starting that relationship and that's a critical thing to keep in mind. Everything about contact building is about time. To give you an example from my own career, um, there's obviously the Salmon Inquiry in Scotland, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, when I started covering that, I knew nothing, I knew no one, and I now can ring up certain people and get an understanding of what's going on pretty quickly. Um, and that is solely 
about time. When I rang them initially, didn't know who I was, didn't know if they could trust me, um, didn't know if they wanted to get, give me any information at all. That's completely changed now. Um, and that's something to keep in mind with contact building. As I say, you know, you don't want to just deal with these people on a professional basis. You should treat them nicely and they will often treat you well. Um, I think I was speaking to an MSP the other day about their favorite band, which turned out to be one of my favorite bands. Um, and if you can guess who likes Godspeed You Black Emperor within the Scottish Parliament, I'll give you a fiver because I don't think any of you will get it. Uh, <laughs> but there you go. At some point, the people you meet as contacts will start to send you stories. They'll learn to trust you and they'll learn to trust you with the information they give you. And they'll also learn to trust the fact that you won't open themselves up to um, potential issues. So if they're an SU staff member and initially they're incredibly worried about losing their job, you know, for five months of dealing with you on a professional basis, they'll probably realize that you're not going to dob them in to the SU staff at some point. This is the sort of way that you can end up getting stories. Um, the classic I overheard X <laughs> is a great way of actually realizing that you've got a story in there for it. Um, I think I was having a conversation with someone on Thursday and it led to two exclusives um, because I followed up on them saying that I'd heard they'd overheard X, Y, and Z. Um, documents that can be passed, you know, say there's a student union banned list of students who can't come in and it's predominantly, you know, BM, BAME students, and that's a obviously would be a pretty big scandal. Um, you know, your student union staff member friend could get you that document or take a picture of it. Or the, the fantastic and rare, by the way, this happened, um, which is lovely when it happens, but is doesn't happen all the time. So moving on, social media. As student journalists, as you might uh, imagine, especially in COVID times, this is your best asset that you have. You're, the be you're probably the best people um, who use it and you know how to use it. Uh, TweetDeck, if you don't know, is a fantastic um, tool. Um, I can send on some additional information if you want some on how to use TweetDeck, but it is essentially Twitter on steroids. Um, join Facebook groups. I think that's one of the simplest things you can do in local journalism. And, it, and yes, people get pissed off when you nick a story from a Facebook group, but they need to realize that Facebook is like the old days of the pub when everyone is talking too loudly and everyone can hear them, you know, share all the gossip just because they post it on Facebook doesn't mean that it's suddenly secret and not, not a uh, fair game. Um, again, from a student point of view, don't join, you know, Trump students for Trump 2024. Um, join the curling club, join, you know, the student group, student union society page or student discussion forums for your area um, or just going to, you know, areas with large student populations, the classic one in Edinburgh that many, I don't know how many people on the call know Edinburgh, but we have the Meadows. There's a Facebook group called the Meadows Share and they put a lot of stuff on there that can be turned into a story if you get permission from the folk involved. And that one's basically obvious. You'll all be doing that at the moment. Um, and yes, a tweet sadly can be a story on its own. Um, again, if any of you follow Scottish politics, you'll have seen Joanna Cherry's uh, phenomenal ability to um, get herself involved in a, in a stushy with her own party. I think at least two or three of those stories this week were just from her tweets. Um, this is probably one of my biggest um, recommendations to student journalists. Um, you can on face on Twitter, obviously set up a notification. So whenever someone tweets, you'll get a notification. I have done that, for example, with um, the woman herself, Nicola Sturgeon, and um, other leaders of, of Scottish political parties. I also did it during COVID with Jason Leach um, and Gregor Smith um, and Fiona McQueen, the sorts of people who, when they tweet, sometimes say something stupid um, or interesting, and you can turn it into a story. For you guys, that's the USU, that's your university, it's your university's press office, that's your sab sabbatical offices, that sort of thing. Um, yep, you want to use Messenger or DMs, generally, if you can, um, to contact people involved in the story that you might want to be interested, mainly because you don't want other journalists to realize that you're onto it. Um, 
this is one that I would recommend as well. Keep your Twitter DMs open. You never know who'll get in touch through Twitter. Uh, the if you can is whether or not you are dependent on or at risk of being abused, which trust me, you're a, if you're a journalist, that's going to happen. Um, DMs being open is a useful tool. It's not going to give you much all of the time unless you are pretty well known, but it's a useful thing to have. So validation of a story. So say you've been told something by a friend that a cat has gone loose in this in the library and has destroyed half of um, I don't know, half of the physics section with its claws. That's a fantastic story if you can if you if you believe it. You shouldn't publish that just basing on your on your friend um, telling you that. Um, so you might want to check that with your university library. You know, to go to the help desk, talk to them, see what they say. If it's true, you might want to talk to the press office. If it's a criminal um, incident, you want to talk to the police. If it's about your SU, self-explanatory, you want to take, talk to your SU. But don't take them on your word. Um, you know, if you have a, someone who, you know, saw the whole thing, saw the cat walk in the door, saw the cat walk up the stairs to the library and take a, a dislike to Einstein, and will happily say that on on record and give you a quote, even if the 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 university turns around and goes, it never happened. You can run that. You can run it with the denial. Um, it's a classic he said, she, she said, um, but you have to make sure you can name that person and quote them in full. Alternatively, you can get someone, uh, get it second sourced. I would always recommend that as a minimum, you want two people familiar with the event to tell you what's going on. Um, that can be, that tends to be people who've actually seen it rather than just heard it because rumor is not something you should publish on. Um, exactly. And that comes on to that point, which is obvious. Um, exactly. If you if it is hearsay, you need a first hand source before you can even confirm it, unless you get a confirmation from an official source. This is classic social media. So, you know, people on social media talking about, um, you know, someone being locked in a in the student uh, halls, for example, you know, if that's going around the around the houses on social media, but you can't get someone to confirm that it's happened and you, the student union student press office won't say that it's happened, then it's not a story. The denial in itself might be a story. So the university saying it hasn't happened. You can say university clarifies X, Y, Z. Um, and that can also run as a story. The exceptions to this are when you've seen a document, provided you can validate the, the veracity of the document, when it's come from an official source, police press release, for example, or if the story is based around a quote, provided that you have a record of that quote in some form. So if someone, for example, your vice chancellor has said something remarkably stupid on an internal video and you have a copy of that video, that's a story. You don't need to um, verify that beyond that, unless of course you're deeply worried about deep fakes, which I think in the world of student journalism would be a shock. So, simple that that's pretty much what everyone's taught early on you know if you can answer those six questions you have a story um you might need to verify that story but you need to be able to answer all of those or at least most of them up to how potentially um in order to uh, be certain that you've got all the facts that a reader would expect you to have and that's what you need to think about is what the reader expects you to know and the, those facts being in the story. A quick one on how to write an intro. It's your first paragraph. Uh, this is straight from the Press Association's uh, training booklet that I think I had when I trained with them for my NCTJ. Um, it should be about 25 words. You want to tell the story in a sentence. You don't want to go into too much detail, but you want to give the most crucial in bits of uh, the story um, in those first 25 words. So, yeah, the most important details go first. So, for example, if on the uh, if there are strikes at your university, which um, I think at the time of writing the UCU was striking across the country, you'd want something like this, which is you know lecturers across the university voted in favour of strike action in a move that could see thousands of students go without lectures for three weeks. That tells your readers, who are presumably students, um, exactly what's going on. 
and how it affects them and why it matters. Not something like this, which is something that is completely understandable for folk who don't have any training to write, but it doesn't tell you why that might matter. So if you compare and contrast the two, the first one tells a student, a student reader that they might not have lectures for three weeks because of this ballot. It doesn't say that the ballot's been decided, but it says that's what could happen, makes it immediately relevant. To this one, they're like, oh, well, you know, that's happening in a month. It doesn't really matter until that happens. It doesn't really matter because I'm not really sure what, what if, what sort of uh, impact that would have on me personally. Um, it's the same information, just presented in a, in a different way. So there's something in journalism known as the inverted pyramid, and I can hear groans from those of you who are on, uh, ever done a journalism course. Um, but it's a really, in, it's a useful thing to have on the background in your head. You know, you want to start this, any story with the information that you must know. So you shouldn't start a story with information that is, you know, secondary or tertiary to the, to the interest. You might want to then add additional information that helps them, but isn't essential. So something like that is the classic one for me at the moment is I actually pretty much have copy pasted a sent two sentences about the Alex Salmond inquiry, which is that um, the committee is investigating the botched handling of harassment complaints against Alex Salmond after um, he won a judicial review at a legal cost of £5,000 to the taxpayer and Alex Salmond um, was acquitted of sexual offence charges in a trial in 2020. That is contextual information for those who maybe aren't following everything uh, play by play. Um, yeah, and the bottom is your classic information that's interesting or nice to have tends to be quotes um, at the bottom, especially if you are uh, working on a straight news story. Um, quotes can often be for higher up if it's a reactionary piece or something like that, but tends to be the quotes are towards the bottom. And that is a critical one on the right hand side of that triangle is they could stop reading at any time. Your readers could read the first three paragraphs and go, you know, sod that, I'm going to click off because it's not relevant to me. I believe, and I might be, I might be getting this slightly wrong, but the analytics at the Scotsman and Evening News shows that readers tend to scroll down about the first 200 words of a story, give or take, and then stop reading. So we had a big restructure back at back in March last year, um, which meant we had to work to certain article sizes. Um, and the most common commonly used are 260 words, 350 words, 550 words, and 900 words. Now, the reason why we have big gap between 500 and 900 is because most people stop reading after 500 words um, when it comes to these stories. When we, were when we were writing stories for about 700 words, people wouldn't bother reading the last 200 words, which meant that we as journalists or we as reporters were wasting our time writing them. Um, so always bear that in mind. Um, you're trying to keep the interest of your, re of your reader for as long as possible. Quotes. Unsurprisingly, if you've ever read a news story, quotes are the bedrock of any story. It helps you get things across. It helps it add opinion, viewpoint, etc., into any story that might be boring otherwise. Um, this is a general rule. Quotes should impart emotion rather than fact. So, for example, if you have a quote like this, which is, you know, explaining various things about an incident and um, say it's a, a fire in a student hall you've got a lot of information in there actually that's factual um that is useful for you to write the story but it's also useful for you to quote because it you know explains how it how the how it all felt for everyone involved um so i would say you've got that quote i would do something like this which would be you know here you go um, witnesses said that the fire started on the first floor, which, if you can see, is in the first sentence of the actual quote before spreading to the second, um, with the fire service arriving about 4 p.m. That's the end of the third sentence of the quote. One witness, who presumably Joe Smith is the person who told you the above, said he was terrified, which is the first thing he said. And then he, you can add that second sentence, which is really emotive and a description of what happens. 
I often see, and I felt I used to do this all the time as when I was um, a junior reporter, is just quoting the whole thing as a quote rather than picking out the actual best bits and forgetting about the fact. It's generally useful to split up quotes, um, quote in full where you can, but take out the factual context and use that to contextualize the quote, if you like. Um, that's a general rule. It doesn't always apply, but it makes it more readable and it helps you, you know, structure your story a bit more professionally. But after having said all of that, as this presentation says, it's not a hard and fast rule. Features, which I'm sure there's plenty of you on here who've written a feature. Um, hard news stories are not features. Features are not hard news story. They should not be written the same way. Um, fluffy or happy stories. Fluffy stories. I love a fluffy story, um, you know, about uh, a cow getting stuck in a dike, which was a genuine story I wrote once in uh, while covering Lowestoft in Suffolk. Um, or, you know, a dog bringing, being found after however many months missing. They can be re rewritten with what's known as a drop intro. So a drop intro should hook a reader in. It shouldn't actually tell the reader what the hell is going on, but it should give the reader the impetus to keep going with the story. They might have been brought in by the headline, and then the drop intro is to get them to read a little bit further on. Um, such as this was one I wrote back in 2020 after a bus driver drove a bus with a guy who was having an epileptic fit on his top deck from uh, the centre of Edinburgh to the Western General or to the, the Royal Infirmary. Um, but basically it was a 20 to 30 minute detour for all these people on the bus. It was in the middle of commuter time and it's a re it was a happy story because the guy survived. Um, so I wrote that as a drop intro doesn't actually tell you what happened but it gets you interested in what has happened hopefully if I've done my job which I don't know if I always do but hopefully that was interesting um, and got people reading moving on how to interview very different types um, you can have plenty where you're just there to kind of get facts from someone so for example say you're at the fire um, that's happened in your student halls and you want to know when it started, how many people were evacuated, how many people are missing, all those sorts of things. You might be asking witnesses for factual information. Um, you can still get quotes out of that, but you're, you're predominantly there to find out information. Um, that's as much an interview as a sit down with your vice chancellor, which covers the second one, which is where you're interviewing someone specifically to get a story from. Um, I did one the other day with uh, Lorna Slater, who's the co-leader of the Greens and, uh, or the Scottish Greens even, and I went into that wanting to talk to her about the Scottish Greens election hopes and came out with two stories, one on the Scottish Greens election hopes and one of her um, talking about her view of an MSP leaving, which was Andy Whiteman, which if you're any of you politics guys will have heard about. Um, that is what you go in for. These are tend to be more searching interviews where you're probing a little bit more. You're trying to get a good quote or a good fact or a little bit of a, you know, additional information on an ongoing scandal or issue. It's essentially the sort of thing you see TV journalists do a lot of. Um, so, for example, on uh, Sky News, such as Breeze, um, uh, current slash former employers, um, uh, you'll see people being interviewed in a way of going, you know, you need to clarify Scottish Labour's position on the in, on independence, for example. That's been asked thousands of times, and frankly, it's pretty dull by now. But, you know, if Anna Sauer or Monica Lennon turns around and goes, you know, we're going to back independence, all of a sudden, you've got a story. And that obviously doesn't always happen, but that's often why you're interviewing someone. Um, that's different too to someone who you're talking to for a response, which might be if you've written a negative story about a business or a restaurant or an individual, you know, student union politician, what you're wanting to talk to them about is what happened, what they think and what their view of it is. And you're looking for quotes in that regard. And talking to someone in the hope of getting a story similar to interviewing someone specifically for a story, they're slightly different, 
in the sense that you might talk to someone just off the off the cuff, off the cuff even, in the vain hope of desperately getting a front page scoop. Um, it happens. Uh, political journalists are known to call their best contacts with the hope of getting a, uh, a story if they are really struggling. Um, as I said, going through, you know, finding out what happened, uh, different people react in different ways. So you have to take uh, take it on differently. Um, don't be put off by one word answers, but you want to ask the sort of question that will give you something that you can quote or something information. So the classic mistake that some young journalists make and some, you know, journalists in training make is, you know, going to a, I don't know, um, a car crash, for example, and going, oh my God, was he going quickly? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, that kind of vaguely helps, but it doesn't really give you much that you can quote with. You know, you could ask, you know, was it scary? Well, yeah, it was a car crash. Of course it was scary. You're going to get the yes answer again. But if you answer it in an open way, which um, will elicit a longer response, you're probably more likely to get something out of it. So what were you thinking when it happened? Well, instead of just saying, yes, it was scary, they would turn around and go, well, do you know what? I wasn't really sure if anyone had survived. Um, it was a harrowing experience to watch the car hit the tree, etc. You've got something you can quote there rather than just a man that said it was scary. Um, if they are uncomfortable with journalists, a common problem. Um, we are one of the least trusted industries in the world. Um, don't jump straight in, you don't have to. Um, common ground and small talk, you, I mean, I bloody hate it, but it's a great way to get people off guard um, and you know, get people to realize that you're not a horrible, scary person who works for the Daily Mail and wants to put them on the front of their newspaper as a you know, migrant-hating murderer. Um, you're just someone who wants to know what's going on. Um, so you don't want to hit them with hard stuff first. You want to go soft. You want to start with, oh, you know, UK. You know, how, how's your day been? I bet this has been a difficult, difficult experience. Um, or if they want to talk about you know, their kids or something like that, talk to them about that before you go any further. Then you want to go with the difficult questions that kind of like, oh, you know, what actually happened? You know, did, you know, did you see something really nasty, et cetera? Um, and then go back to softer stuff afterwards. You know, it's, 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 it's a, this is a general rule for when things finding out happen. Critically, you'll just get better with it the more you do it. Um, no one enjoys the first interview they do um, with anyone. It's why journalism on work, journalism kids on work experience, for example, are sent to do Vox Pops, which are the bane of my life. And anyone who's ever been a journalist detests a Vox Pops, unless they're a sociopath. Um, and you'll end up with, on the street, trying to ask people questions and getting nothing from it. But after the fifth or sixth try, you'll be better than, it, than you were on the first try. Investigative techniques. This was this presentation was done for a group of guys who were interested in this sort of stuff. So hopefully this helps. Um, it's a very basic thing. I've not done a lot of it, but what I have done um, has tended to be okay. But it's been along you know the same sorts of lines. Uh, if you don't know what freedom of information is, um, find out. It is uh, the single uh, strongest piece of investigation uh, tool that you have as a student journalist. You can ask for documents, data, correspondence, which is emails and letters, um, records, so archival records, etc., um, and various other things. You know, like cost, for example. So you could ask your university how much it costs for them to do a, a impact assessment on uh, keeping people locked in their halls during COVID, for example. Um, often, uh, public bodies who are under the scope of FOI, which tends to be anything that is funded by the government or run by the government. Uh, universities are helpfully under FOI, but student unions tend not to be. Um, they'll often just say, no, sort of, not getting that information from us. They might give you an exemption such as cost or personal information or confidentiality. Review it, always. Basic thing. Doesn't matter if they say no and it's a genuine reason, review it anyway. A, because it's fun. B, because you might get it, get the uh, data anyway. Um, you want to look at the exemption. You can't just review um, off the back of, you know, irritation, but it, you want to give some reason. Um, the Scottish Information Commissioner's website is a fantastic resource for this. 
Um, if you're FOIing uh, English or Welsh uh, public bodies that might operate in Scotland, such as the UK government agencies, etc., you'll need to go through to the ICO. But for Scotland public bodies, the SIC is fantastic. I think their website is it's publicknowledge.co.uk. Um, they will have fantastic resources. I use them all the time on guidance for exemptions that public bodies might use. Um, and reasons why that are genuine that you can uh, that you can you know challenge them on. So the classic one, which I'm doing at the moment, which I can't really say much more about because it's in the process of. But the classic one you often get is uh, um, public bodies turning around and going, say we can't give you that information because it will cause a loss of confidence in the organisation, um, which is you know essentially code for we effed up big uh, <laughs> to say to put it mildly that's not a genuine reason to refuse an foi and if you appeal that you'll often win um after your initial review you can appeal that to the information commissioner in scotland that's the scottish information commissioner in england that's the ico information commissioner's office and um, that's actually really easy it takes a while um but it is dead easy um, and they'll often take you through it, talk to you over the phone about reasons why the exemption has come through. You can often get the data from the public body before a decision is issued because the public body is lent on by the information commissioner to do what they should have done initially. And that avoids them getting a black mark against them in, a, in the form of a decision notice. Um, other techniques for investigations, talking to people, you know, for example, if you're doing an investigation into a dodgy society that maybe, or a fraternity, like there was in Edinburgh a few years ago when I was there, um, you want to talk to former staff members, students, society members, you know, people who know in and out how these things work and can tell you that. Um, follow the money. I added this one the other day. This is slightly complicated because it's quite, it can be quite technical, but company's house is a great, great thing. So for example, if your student union has decided that the way forward for it is to hire security um, or actually maybe a better way is to, you know, start a new procurement process on beef with a farm. You can look up the company that they've done that with, find out whether or not that company is ethical, find out whether or not, you know, that company is owned by a massive corporation or by, you know, a dodgy person that you, that the student union would be embarrassed to be involved in. Um, you can get classic things. You, the, you'll have seen a lot of during COVID cronyism accusations towards the um, the UK government for you know PPE contracts and stuff. Often the way that journalists find this stuff out is through companies' house um, and just tracking back and following people and who owns the company and what involvement they have, what other companies they they know and exist in, and what those companies' links are. Um, so it can be very useful. Undercover work, this comes with a major disclaimer. You can only do undercover work under um, the editor's code. If you have genuinely gone through every single possible route to get the information that you're looking to, and that includes talking to the um, uh, official press office, etc., cetera, um, you have to have exhausted all lines of inquiry. You can't start something by going, uh, I'm gonna go undercover as a first year student in PE, for example, um, you have to have exhausted your lines of inquiry up to that point, unless there is no chance of you getting that information any other way. So there's a great example from the Scotsman. Some of you guys might know Martin McLaughlin, who's a colleague of mine who covers Donald Trump. He was actually taken to um, the press regulator for going undercover to a talk by one of, uh, I think it was Donald it was Donald Trump's business partner's, you know, talk in a church where she was saying she was evangelizing various things. And the Trump org complained about this, said, how dare he? There was no way in hell that, you know, we'd have let him in if we'd known he was there. Um, or, you know, I think I think actually he was, it was they would have said, oh, we would, we would have let him in or it was a private event. And Martin and the paper just turned around and went, well, you've, consistently refused entry for us on every single thing that we've ever asked for. There was no other way of us getting in other than doing it the way we did. These are some of the 
other things, data journalism, you know, there's a lot of open data in the world and the ONS publish a lot. You can speak to ex experts about things. I, I, I'd be careful with court documents. It's useful, but, to, you know, legally uh, quite uh, legally risky. Contacts, contacts, contacts. That's everyone you know. Um, you know, your friend who was involved in the rugby club might know about hazing at the rugby club, for example, if you're doing an investigation into that. Um, they might not speak to you, but they might point you in the right direction. So 10 minutes left. So I think I've done that quite well. Um, any questions? There are my, that is my email and my Twitter. If you want to get in touch, I'd recommend Twitter first, then email, because I get 500 emails a week, most of which are completely useless. And yours might get buried in the Scottish Tories' latest anti indie Ref 2 uh, press release. So note those down if you want. Um, and get in touch if you've got any questions you don't want to ask today. But Morris, I'll hand, hand back to you to deal with questions if there are any. Well, Connor, that was fantastic. That was such a good presentation, like truly bravo. Um, so interesting. Um, I'm just checking the chat right now and I'm not seeing any questions, but uh, I just thought it was so interesting, especially stuff like TweetDeck. He said it was like Twitter on steroids. Like it's like going to the matrix. Um, is it difficult to use TweetDeck? Like you said, you didn't oh, want, want, to, want to go into it, but you made you made it sound so interesting, <laughs> calling it that. It's 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 pretty easy TweetDeck. It's essentially gives you a the actual chronology, um, you know of of your Twitter rather than the algorithm driven kind of standard way of looking at it, and you can, you know, do. Uh, geographical based searches where only information from twi twit from your local area will come up. You can have various different lists. In fact, if I, if I go off that briefly, I'll just show you what it looks like um, when it is out, when it really is on steroids. Um, hopefully oh, so I've got various Yes. So I've got my own personal feed, uh, a list of Scottish politics folk, a list of MSPs and what they tweet, a list of Scottish MPs and what they tweet, um, mm -hmm. an Edinburgh one from when I was at the news, um, a breaking news one, which is all the big papers, one for Scotsman, which is uh, for mentions, which can be quite useful for stories when people reply to stories. Mm -hmm. um, the geocode ones are the geographical searches. Um, again, that's just a basic word search for Edinburgh, and um, just in case stuff comes up. Scott Rail, back in the days of having to do train stuff, notifications, messages, blah, 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 blah. Food and drink, activity, which is, can be handy if you follow uh, politicians who like things accidentally that you might not think that people can see. Um, yeah, it's pretty comprehensive. So wow. You can, oh you can do pretty much anything you want with it. I tend not to use it nowadays because I don't have a big enough screen. Mm -hmm. um, but that is essentially it. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now because I imagine everyone has got what they needed from me. Yeah, we, have a, we, have an, we even have a um, question from Shane. And the question is that I'd like to know if there are any other social media which are, which are good other than um, Twitter and whatnot? Yeah, I'd say um, the obvious one is Facebook. It's a cesspit, almost as bad as Twitter, but there's plenty on it. And there's a Facebook group for everything. Um, so I'd recommend having a proper search for that, you know, especially for student-based stuff, it's, it's a useful thing to do. Instagram, more and more, is becoming a... a, a means through means that people who are famous and important tend to address their fans and mm -hmm. um, and it's often where you'll get a lot of stories from younger people TikTok, i mean i don't use it but sea shanties are a big thing now apparently mm -hmm. and i only found out about that through the news which shows you know mm -hmm. maybe i'm out of touch but it's a good example again youtube as well you know pretty much anything uh, do you have 
see regarding like investigations and whatnot, do you have any like ethical advice when you're doing investigations? Like maybe you, I, I, would you dissuade people from presenting themselves as something else, like hiding who they are or saying that they're a member of staff and they're not to get into places and whatnot? Or is that a way I think, I think that kind of, so the editor's code talks about something called subterfuge, which is, uh, you know, where you pretend to be someone you're not, for example, or go undercover. And it's something to be wary of. But if it's the only way you're going to get the information you're going to get, and you've exhausted all the all the rest, and all the other lines of inquiry, um, you have to weigh up the ethics of it. Yeah. So, you know, uh, LinkedIn, actually, yeah, Anthony, that's right. Um, LinkedIn is a really good place to find out, um, you know, work biographies. Um, I hate it, Anthony, so I don't tend to use it, but you're right. I've used it for, you know, finding out where people have been in work before. But yeah, going back to your question, Morris, like it's, uh, you have to be careful. You need to have an editorial discussion with your editors before you do anything like that to make sure that you're not overstepping the mark ethically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if the only way you can get um, a story about the SU for example, um, and their work practices, for example, you know, maybe they overwork and underpay people and no one's willing to say that on the record for fear of losing the job. You know, you getting a job with the SU um, and finding out what that's like, it's a way of getting the story. It's not necessarily very ethical, but you can do it. I, I just be very cautious. It should be a last resort. Wow. Well, that was a great answer. Um, anyway, that's been a wonderful presentation and you've been really good at answering questions and whatnot. We have a good audience too. And I suppose that will be wrapping up our first event. It's been pretty sweet. And we'll remember everyone that we'll be doing the uh, award announcements for the um, Scottish Regional Conference, uh, the actual awards and all the various ones on the Twitter account, Spa Journalism. That's it. Thanks for having me. You're having it. Yeah, it's been wonderful. I loved it. Does it just stop?